Hello, everyone. Welcome to our very first episode of The Rage Room. I am your host, Amanda, and this is my co-host, Karen. Hello, everyone. This is our very first episode, and so we wanted to start this off with a pretty good bang. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about the case of Allison Botha. This case is about a 27-year-old woman. She lives in Port Elizabeth, South Africa. She really didn't know what she wanted to do as she got older, spent some time traveling and studying, and then she became an insurance broker. Now, this isn't really what she wanted to do with her life, per se. It wasn't her dream, but this was kind of like her tie-me-over job. So get something kind of steady while she's figuring things out as she gets older. So what did she want to do with her life? That's what she really doesn't know. So with that, she's just trying to figure out who she wants to be, what she wants to do with her life. She's still really young and has the whole you know world ahead of her and just trying to decide what she wants to do. So Allison, she was born on September 22nd, 1967. Her parents divorced when she was 10, and she was raised with her mother, Claire and Neil. And although Claire and Neil aren't really a big part of the story, it's just kind of important to get a backstory of who this person is. Right. Um, so I'm going to take you back to December 18th, 1994. Now, this is in South Africa, so their December is basically our July. Oh. So Because they're on the opposite sides of the okay. spectrum. So warm summer day and Allison went to the beach with her friends they spent the whole day there had a good time and then they decided to go back to Allison's place and get some pizza and some games and kind of just you know take off the just evening hang out. yeah okay. pretty much pretty much a perfect summer day if you ask me um, when the evening hours started rolling in everyone started clearing out like most people do and Allison had a friend and she decided to give her a ride home she had laundry there and that she needed to pick up anyway so she's like I'll just give you a ride home so Allison takes her friend home and when she comes back the parking spot in front of her apartment was gone because it's just that type of night people are coming in so she had to park on another street and statistically this is actually what is really dangerous right now especially in college areas is because the parking isn't really adequate for where these kids live, or young adults, really. And so they're having to park further, so they're more isolated. Right. A lot of the times they're not lit up the same. Right. And it just gives, statistically, a more uh, bad case scenario of being alone without any kind of protection. So she parks on another street. It's not a well-lit street. It's a lot darker. She describes parking under a tree. Under a tree. Under a tree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, under a tree, and... That's when she's, like, gathering her stuff like all of us do. So we normally put our car in park. I'm grabbing my purse. I'm getting anything out of the back, my drink. Whatever I've done through the day, I'm kind of getting out of my car. And she also had her laundry. So the situation is that she's, again, she's parked in an area where it's not well lit. Um, There's not a lot of, um, you know, visual for people to actually really even see her. Right. uh, What situation she was in. And you and I both know, as women, we always always try to grab everything all together. So, yeah, she's getting everything and got her hands full. So in this particular type of situation, you know, you become unaware Mm -hmm. of your surroundings. Uh, And it's very easy for all of us to do. We become very unaware of our surroundings when we're busy gathering our our things and you know, trying to get ourselves together and get inside. So. Basically just in our own world, just concentrating on ourselves, not really any situational awareness. And it, right. it is typically when things go awry very quickly. Right. Yeah, they catch people off guard. And a lot of predators and people like out there, they actually look for that and they aim to catch women off guard for that matter. Right. Um, so as she's gathering her stuff, Allison feels a like her door open and feels a cold metal to her neck. And a man appears, and she says, move over, or he says, I'm sorry, move over, or I'll kill you. Oh, frightening. Yeah. So in an interview with Allison, and I actually watched this documentary, it's on Amazon Prime, and it is called Allison. She talks about how she was really thoughtless and careless about locking her doors and while she was in her car. Mm-hmm. And this is back in 1994, like when I put my car in drive, when I shut it off, right, when I put it in drive, it locks. When I shut it off, the only side that opens is when I actually manually open it myself, but the remainder of the doors stay locked. Right. This is 1994. That kind of technology didn't, you know, was probably one of those push-up locks. You know what I'm talking about? The, where you pull right. them up. So it wasn't as simple as to just lock every 
door in your car, and she said she frequently did not lock her car. So as the man tells her to move over, she calmly does so. So she's thinking in her head, if I just comply, we'll see what's going on. Just kind of figure out what's going on. And as the man began to drive, Allison talks about going into a state of shock, just in utter disbelief as to what's happening with her. She's watching all of her home comforts disappear as he's driving away. Everything that she's known, she's driving away. She has no control over what's going on. So everything's just kind of fading off in the the background at this Mm -hmm. point. Um, And not only that, but like friends, family, all of this stuff, they're at home sleeping at this point. They have no idea. They've assumed that she's gone home and she's safe. And Allison is just starting to begin the worst night of her life. The man turns to her and tells him his name is Clinton. And that he was looking for someone who owed him some money, and he just needed her car for like an hour or so, and that if she complied, she would be fine and free. So this girl is thinking that this is basically just a simple carjacking, Mm -hmm. Um, and even though that in itself is terrifying, she has no idea what is next. Exactly. So she's thinking, I'll just comply. He'll drop me off. It'll be... She's trying to like calm and self-soothe herself at this point. Plus, he gave her his name, so... Most of the time, people like that don't typically do something like that unless it's pretty, not as dangerous, I should say. Um, so with the small talk, it kind of gives her a false sense of security of like, okay, this will be fine. But Allison does begin to plea with him. is like, if you just need the car, if someone owes you money, like, just let me go. Take the car. And he doesn't. Um, so he suddenly stops the car out of the shadows and another man appears and gets in the back seat. Oh, boy. And Clinton introduces him to his new friend. Now, at this point, no name has been given. And Allison talks about this moment being the exact moment that she knew that she was in trouble. Um, She described looking into the rearview mirror. And she she states that all she saw was dead eyes and a complete look of absolute evil. So, like, the eeriness alone of, like, looking in a rearview car. Like, if anybody's seen a horror film... You automatically know, like, when you see something in a mirror, it can give you the creeps automatically anyway. And to see something like that and describe that as dead eyes and absolute evil, you could imagine the presence that she felt in the car at that time. Allison watched the lights in the road fade as they drew further and further away from everything that she has lived her life in. Everything that she's familiar with, they start going further out, there's less lights. So Allison watches the lights from the road fade, and as they drove further and further out to this deserted spot, she talks about in the documentary of how she remembers seeing the last street light, like that was the last lit scene that she saw until they headed out into the complete darkness. Finally, they get to their destination, and they stop the car and said, we're going to have sex with you, are you going to fight us? Like right off the bat, no conversation, just... Here's what's going to happen to you. And this isn't even everything that happens to her. This is just their starting point, right? The man in the back gets out of the car and leaves her and Clinton, the first guy that took the car, in the car alone. So trigger warning to those. We will be discussing sexual assault. Viewer discretion is advised. We are going to try to tame it down just because we don't want to get in too much detail of that. This moment, Allison thought to herself, like, surely she'll just get through it. She'll shut it off. Like... If it's going to allow her to survive, she's gonna, she'll get through it. So Allison was forced to perform oral sex on Clinton and then have it done to her. Oh, God. And then he went on to rape her. So Allison talks about this in the documentary as well, about during the assault, her body responded mm-hmm. to, um, I'm not sure what scenario it was, but she said that to her it was the worst betrayal of herself. And, like, just being genetically made up, Like, your body's going to respond to something like that. It's just, it's normal. But in her mind, after this, she's talking about how it felt at the time, like it was the worst betrayal, like she had taken part of this. It was a a guilt type of thing. Exactly. And and unfortunately, females, you know, when they've actually been, you know, abused or or, sexually violated, for some reason, and, and society has put this on women as well, Mm-hmm. You know, that there's a reason for it, that you invited that or you wanted that or you did something to cause that. And for her body to just naturally respond the human bo- with the way the human body actually does, you know, I can imagine she felt 
a tremendous amount of shame and guilt, which we all know logically she had no part of. And right. she shouldn't have felt that way. But anatomy is anatomy at the end of the day. Right, I right, mean, you exactly. can't fight that type of anatomy. It's And unfortunately for her, I can't imagine being in that situation and being so confused, you know, as to something so terrible happening to her right. and her body still responding to it. And then the fear on top of that, the, the, the gut-wrenching fear she must have had at, at, at the time as well. I mean, just, it's it's something that, you know, none of us couldn't, unless we had it happen to us ourselves, we just can't even imagine. No, and we can't. And this is where Clinton kind of takes on a different role, is like he's not uh, very violent in this assault. He is talking to her, saying things like, does your boyfriend do this to you? Like, not really in an aggressive manner. Um, and as we've seen Clinton in this, is he has been really more about trying to ease her mind, which is a really bizarre turn on this particular case. Clinton had raped her in the car, and that's when she heard the other man call Clinton by his real name, which is Franz. So she then realizes that this guy has lied to her, that this is not his actual name, and that his name is Franz, not Clinton. As she heard Franz call out to the other man, she heard him say his name which is Tense. So, and that's T-H-E-U-N-S, which took me a really long time to try to pronounce. Um, now, were these two men, were they from South Africa? Mm-hmm. Or were they just visiting? Or they No, were... and we'll get into that. They are from there. Um, okay. They are from there, and they are well-known in police and crime. They are well-known. Okay. So this is... And we'll talk about this once we get past that point, but they are well-known in the crime community. They are frequent flyers to the police, and um, which really also is why it makes this case really as infuriating as it is. So now she knows both of their names, Franz and Tiance, and Franz asks Tiance if he wanted to turn with the lovely lady. Again, using this type of lingo for somebody who has just raped somebody, and is like calm and almost sweet about it. Would you like terms with the lovely lady? Like nobody does that. Right. I've never heard of anyone <laughs> being charming during a rape. No. Just, usually rape is, is, is about control. It is. And it's normally very fast paced and violent and then done. Right. Um, and so that's when he replies, Tiance replies with a rather vulgar statement, which I will not repeat on the channel because I do want to keep it not only for Allison, but for people watching this, I want to try to keep it more rated to an easier level, that he doesn't just want to have sex with her, that he wanted to do something else. Franz gets mad at Tians because he said that what he said about not wanting to have sex with her, he wanted to dot, dot, dot. And he said, you can't talk to a lovely lady like that. Like, this is their interaction. Like, these two men that have clearly planned this, and now he's frustrated with him, basically, like, you can't talk to the lovely lady like that, which is so bizarre yeah exactly states that she is a lady and he must speak properly to her (laughs) shocking i i was it was one of the biggest things that i was kind of appalled by because it's a very confusing not only to people reading the story but it's very confusing to allison well i kind of take that as he's giving trying to give allison maybe a false sense of security if that can even make sense. Right. It's like, here I am doing this horrendous thing to you, but just to keep you from fighting us, I'll try to put you your mind at ease a little bit that we'll do what we need to do and then this will all be over. Right. I think he was really trying to just give her a false sense of security. Makes sense, especially as to what we're about to go into. So Allison doesn't remember a lot of the next sexual assault with Tiance, and it is because he began to choke her and it was more violent than what she had experienced with Franz. What she remembers was she was being choked or strangled, and we all know in real life that this is not how Hollywood or any show predicts it. It is actually very difficult to strangle somebody to death, and that was his ultimate goal. He wanted to strangle her to death. And so the very thing, last thing that she remembers was that her bowels evacuated. This has all happened. She is now outside of the car, and he thinks that he has now strangled her to death. Right. And that's when they see her leg twitch. And Allison, very in-depth, talks about how she was in and out of consciousness, consciousness through all of this, which, on the lighter side of things, the silver lining of such this horrible case... I guess it would be better to be unconscious while all this was happening right. than to actually 
be fully aware of the experience. Right, exactly. So when they think that she's dead, they see her leg twitch, and she's in and out of consciousness, and she remembers them beginning to stab her. And they started at the abdomen taking turns. And then she also remembers that Tiantz stabs her first, and Franz pushes him, like mad pushes him, and takes over and starts stabbing her in the throat. So this the same guy, wow. the same guy that you know he's given her this false name, this false sense of security. He's mad at Tians again because he's stabbing her in the abdomen. And Tians talks about this that he wanted to com- completely obliterate her reproductive organ. That he hated everything about females that made them a woman, which would be wow. their lower abdomen, right? right? So ovaries, uterus, all of the things that are very important to a woman. That's the first thing he went for. And Franz, Clinton, Franz gets upset, pushes Tiance off of him, and starts stabbing her in the throat. Like he was angry because the other guy was getting to have all the, I guess, to them, fun? (laughs) No, I have no idea. that's, That's so wild. I have no idea why, but I don't know if he felt like... At this moment, she was kind of his property or that he had some kind of... I have no idea why, but we see this, like, this common theme with him. Like, he's getting frustrated with Tians and, like, coming in and doing something better or telling him he can't do that or he can't do that, which is very strange to me in this whole situation. So, Allison was stabbed in the abdomen in excess of 36 times. Oh, my God. Yeah. And in the neck, the doctors state at least 17 times in the neck. Now, the neck and the abdomen are very different as far as the space. So you've got, you know, an abdomen, and you've got a little neck. So, Smaller area. Right. Yeah, so 36 right. times in the abdomen, even though it's an excess and it's a lot, mm-hmm. 17 times in the neck, that's, that's not a whole lot of space for someone to get stabbed 17 that times, times yeah, in the neck. When she comes to again, she realizes they are finishing... And she starts to see their feet get smaller and smaller. So she's still alive through all She's still alive, yeah. She's still alive. She's still in and out of consciousness. Yeah. And she sees their feet getting smaller, and their voices are becoming more faint. So they finally leave. They leave her out, like, under a bush in the dirt, basically like a piece of roadkill. And although they thought she was dead, Allison laid there, in fact, alive. So what what amount of damage was actually done? Because you know you have those, you know the juggler, you know right right through here and all, and all that. Yeah. So seventeen times, you're thinking that's got to be like she's got to die, like she's going to bleed out. There's no way someone's going to survive seventeen times in the neck. And because, you would think that that would almost decapitate her to some point. I mean, depending on how large the knife was. So. Right. So that's what we're going to get into. We're going to get into the excess of her injuries um, throughout the next story. So viewer discretion is advised. Just going to give a trigger warning. We will be going into some graphic details of those wounds. After all of this happens and Franz and Tiance are leaving, she says that she can hear this gurgling sound and she has this labored breathing and feels this gurgling sound. And it's very loud, and she really didn't understand what was going on, and she describes having this outer body experience where she realized she was dying. She was completely, like, overcome with sadness, and she rose up above her body. She doesn't understand how it happened, but she's having an outer body experience. She's looking down and realizing, like, I'm going to die here. And she said in that moment that everything became silent when she left her body. Like, she did not hear the gurgling through her throat anymore. She did not hear the labored breathing. Everything was completely silent. And she talks about knowing that she had a choice. And she decided that she wanted to live a life worth living. And so she talks about going back to her body. And as soon as she re-entered her body, essentially all of the sounds came back. So the gurgling in the throat the labored breathing and, you know, utter shock of what's going on. Got to get justice. And so she writes in the sand, in dirt, she writes Tiens and France, their name. And then underneath it, she writes, Mom, I love you. Oh, my God. Right. So she's thinking, if I don't survive this, at least they'll know their names. Like, that was important to her. She doesn't really know the extent of everything that's going on, and she thinks, I've got to get justice. I've got to get out of this situation still at this point. So not about, I've got to survive this, but 
I've got to get justice. For yeah, this. like I get these guys. Yeah, this is not going to be my the end wow. of my story. She's trying to like pull herself out towards the road, and that's when she feels something wet and squishy between her legs. And this is when that she realizes that it's her intestines. Oh my god! So Allison had been completely disemboweled. All of her intestines were out of her stomach. She's completely naked out in the elements of South Africa. So she's trying to get up. She's written what she needs to write. She's trying to get to the road, and she's like, "I gotta get up. I've gotta. I gotta walk." And so she's holding her her intestines with with one hand, and she goes to stand up, and she s- describes like completely going black, could not see anything. And in fact, she was seeing something, but she didn't realize what it was. She was seeing the sky at night. And she went to reach for her head, and her hand went inside of a huge neck wound. And they had actually severed the whole neck muscle that holds our head on top of our body. Yeah. You were kidding. No. So when she stood up, her head fell back between her shoulder blades. And that's why she remembers, like, seeing black because it went straight up to the sky. Wow. I mean, if you think about this, there's no way that she would have or could have even, in our minds, couldn't have right. survived that. And it's just a real testament to the power of the human mind. Um, and when it kicks into survival mode, you know, I mean, you... Just like you said, she didn't even know that she was, her head was so severed. Yeah. Um, and her she was disemboweled. And and still the mind was rejecting that and, and was fighting for you know, survival. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So it's important, and I don't think a lot of people have covered this, but when Tiance raped Allison and strangled her to what he thought was to death, right, they essentially saved her life at the same time. So Allison probably would have died after the stabbings because he had already strangled her. She was already unconscious. But because they stabbed her neck, it created an airway for her lungs to get air. Wow. So this was a really important part of the story that I was like, even in the matter of all of this evilness and trauma that, Something so brutal actually saved her life. Like, she would have not had an airway. She probably would have died there on the scene. And because they went for her neck, they created an airway, and she was stabbed right between the collarbone, you know, by the trachea, and that's where she hears that gurgling sound was because that's where they stabbed her, or one of the spots out of the 17 that they stabbed her. Allison makes her way. She starts crawling because at this point she cannot hold her head. She cannot hold her intestines like with each hand. She cannot walk. And she decides just to start crawling to the road. And she sees headlights come up on her. And at first she's thinking, oh my gosh, this is probably them coming back, coming back to make sure they finish the job. And this car pulls up to her, stops. And then proceeds to drive away. Yeah. No. Yes. So they they can clearly see that something, even if this is not not normal, right? So even if you thought it was roadkill, would you not something of that size? You can tell. Right. I mean, how dark was it out there? And even even with headlights, I mean, you would be able to tell that this is a human being laying there. So a lot of times what happens is that when people see something this traumatizing or this horrendous, something so out of the norm, because face it, most folks aren't used to seeing dead bodies or mangled bodies. Right. It's just not an everyday thing for us. Um, No matter how desensitized we've become with, with television and movies and things like that, it's, you know, to see those things in real life, uh, it's a completely different experience, I will tell you that. It is. I guess it's where that flight or fight kind of clicks in, where people right. are like, oh, no, this may not be real. I'm out. I mean, you don't know. You it's don't know who was driving that car. It could have been a kid. Right. You just really don't know. But I was just like, they drove away. <laughs> like, right. You know? Right, exactly. But everybody's made up different, so I can't speak for that person in the car. Um, so at this point, she's like, man, that's that's it. Like, I'm going to die out here. And that's when she sees another set of headlights come up to the road. And this car stops. And in this car is a Dr. Tian Ellard. And he is away on 
Holiday. He is a, um, I believe, a veterinary tech in veterinary school. He's a doctor now, but then he was a veterinary tech student. He was away on holiday with friends, and they were wrapping up their day. Just happened to be driving down that route, and he pulls up on what they thought was roadkill. And that that confuses me. How how could they even think that something like? Well, I guess with being in Africa, I guess. I mean, it's dark it's for one. Of, exactly, yeah, it's I dark. So, yeah. You can't see. You, there's her organs are outside of her body. Her head is almost decapitated at this point. There's probably a ton of blood. She's covered in dirt and sand. Really, at this point, hard hard to really tell. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So they Let's initially stop. Be. Right. So they initially stop thinking. Okay, this is probably roadkill. But he says that he thought, well, it's too big to be roadkill. So he gets out of his car and realizes this is a human being, not roadkill. And so he goes up to Allison and he sees the first thing he sees is her eyes, and he describes them as being like eyes completely red. And it was when she was strangled that her eyes completely hemorrhaged, which the bloods of vessels had popped. Right. And he gets down on his belly and holds her hand. And he says, you have nice eyes. And he tells his friend at the time who had a cell phone, which was also really unheard of at that time. Phones and his friends just happened to have one. Happened to have one. And so they call for EMS. And even though they are only 15 minutes from the hospital, it took EMS 45 minutes to an hour to get to her. Wow. Yeah. He also talks about when they loaded her that they were not driving fast. They were not driving with lights and sirens. Like, they were just kind of like, well, she's basically already dead. Well, just take our time. Wow. Like, they didn't have a sense of um, urgency. urgency. Which, to me, that's a whole nother soapbox because I just can't imagine treating somebody like they're not an emergency, no matter what the situation is. Like, that's literally your job. So she gets to the hospital. The doctors talk about how... She is completely covered in a fine layer of black sand and dirt. Her hair is matted with dried blood, leaves, twigs. Mm -hmm. Her nails are caked with dirt. Like, to even identify that this was a human person at this point was very difficult. And so that means all of her intestines were covered in that same fine, fine layer of sand. Right. Yeah. So that she had to undergo surgery, but before they could even address anything that was going on they had to cleanse her body they had to irrigate with saline solution clean everything before they could even fix the punctures and it's important to note that also throughout all this allison did not go through one infection that's incredible through all of this that's almost divine intervention i mean just just alone that she even survived this to begin with yeah um and and then no infections with with all of your bowels, yeah. especially all your intestines hanging out. It's like how and does that sand. Happen? Like how fine is sand? How does that happen? Yeah. An infection can start from. I mean, we've seen people with like the smallest amount of splinter, and you see they get a small infection, right? right? The body pushes it out. So it would only take one grain of sand to really cause the body to say, "Oh, we're going to have some issues." Right. So they they repaired her neck. And thankfully, her voice box, out of 17 stab wounds, her voice box and her carotid were missed. Wow. I don't know how it happens. When detectives came in to talk to her, she was obviously intubated. She had a tube because trachea was completely severed, but her voice box and her carotid were not. So they had to go in and re repair that trachea, and that's what we breathe out of. So they placed a tube, and they, you know, they get her patched up. They put a tube in, and detectives come in so they can see what's going on, kind of assess what's going on. And she writes on a piece of paper, Franz and Tiens for them. Wow. Yeah. So the detectives at this point, they know this person that they have dealt with who has the same first name. Now, mind you, she doesn't know the last names. The prosecuting office was like, we can't take any case unless she verbalizes it. You're, what? <laughs> they said, we have more of a case. We will not be able to build this case as much as we want unless she can verbalize their names. Okay, my mind is blown. That, that's the, that is just absolutely absurd. Right. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, detectives knew of a Franz Dutuy 
And it is because he had been involved in crime and has a history of rape. They also knew that Franz had a friend named Tiance Kruger. And when she wrote their name on the paper, that's how they kind of like, let's, let's just check these guys out. But they also needed her to vocalize it, which still going to keep it censored here is absolutely unbelievable that you would ask somebody to say something like that when they have a tube in their throat. So the doctors are like, annoyed and you will severely compromise if we pull that tube her trachea all of this work that we've just done to her throat you could completely compromise it and we could have to start all over allison goes against medical advice has them pull the tube so that she can say franz and tense wow that's an incredible i mean wow yeah i mean just just to have that uh you know, being so resolved to to seek justice, uh, to have something like that, you know, like, I'm I'm going to get these guys. Yeah. No matter what. I, even if I have to, you know, if I die doing it, I'm going to get these guys. Right. So if they want me to say it, pull the tube. That's what incredible courage and resilience that this young lady had. I mean, it just it blows my mind. Yeah. So 26-year-old Franz Dutuy and 19-year-old Tiance Kruger were arrested on at 5 a.m. on December 19th. Wait, they were that young? Yeah, they were that young. But this all happened at 1 a.m. between the hours and 1 and 4 a.m. on the 18th. And the very next day at 5 a.m. on the 19th, they had these guys in custody because she vocalized it. Right. And these guys had a history of criminal charges, of rape, And we'll talk about some of those um, here in a minute. But so they arrest them. They take them in. And Detective Humpel told Kruger, Tiance Kruger, first. And he said, you're being arrested for the rape and attempted murder. Kruger was actually shocked. And the detective talks about this moment. And he was like, why the lesser charge? And the detective's like, what? What? And he's like, why not murder? Why is it the lesser charge of attempted murder? And he said, because Allison survived. Wow. Yeah. So at this point, he says, well, she's going to tell you everything. I confess. And he had her ring on his hand, still with her blood on it, because they tested it to link it back to the case to build this for trial. And basically was like, well, she's going to tell you everything, so... Here you go. Confesses everything. Gives him back the jewelry that they stole from Allison that night. So did he also let them know that his friend was involved in... Yeah, they've both been arrested at the same time. Okay. But this is just separate how they told them. Got it. So when Detective told France about his charges, the same thing, you know, attempted murder, assault, rape, all of that stuff, he said they were planning on doing it again tonight. Oh, They were going to take a woman, abduct her, rape her, and then they were planning to push her from a bridge. So not only did Allison save herself and get justice for herself, she also, with her bravery and her resilience, saved someone else from going through the same fate. Yeah, if not worse. Because, you know, I mean, we know criminals can change their mind at any moment what they want to do with somebody. Right. And the fact that they were so ready to do it the next night, which if you watch anything in criminology or psychology, it talks about any kind of serial killer. They have a ramping stage, right? So they'll kind of space and then they ramp up. And I believe truly that they were in their ramp up at this point. Like they were planning the next night. They were planning another woman. And that this was going to happen again and again and again until they basically got caught. He showed no remorse, and he confessed to the whole thing, told them that they were planning on doing it again, and also he says that this was all because of Satanism. Oh. So this is in 1994 when the Satanic Panic was really, really popular, even in in South Africa, the United States, because of everything that happened with the Manson family. Satanism was really causing this upward panic because people didn't really understand the religion, how it worked, and that kind of thing. But he also tells the the detective that he's possessed by a demon, and he had undergone an exorcism before, and it was the demon that wants to rape and murder women, not him. Wow. Yeah. Like the devil made me do it. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, my God. 
And then prior, I'm going to take you back to December the 4th, they kidnapped and raped a pregnant woman. And they released her and basically said, don't go to the cops. And she went to the cops. And this happened, I don't know the date of the other one, but it happened another time prior. Okay. Um, there's not a lot of information on that woman. Same thing. They raped her, let her go. She went to the cops. So at this point, they're thinking we can't let them go because they go to the cops. And so that's why Allison was chose to be murdered at that moment. Still, I don't understand for the life of me. I know the justice system is not perfect, but how these men had already gone through stuff like this and both of them are out just walking the streets. Now? Still? No, no, no. Before. Before they got Allison. They had already had a rape charge on them. And they're still out. And they're still out. So they're officially charged with two counts of abduction, two counts of assault, two counts of rape, one count of robbery, and one count attempted murder. With all of that, Franz was sentenced to three life sentences with no possibility of parole. Tiens was sentenced to one life with no possibility of parole. And the judge personally asked that a note be placed in their file so that authorities knew that the judge wanted them to remain in there for the rest of their lives. There was some legislation that passed in 2003 that anybody that had been convicted to life sentence before 2003 and had served such and such amount of times, they could basically get an appeal, try to get an appeal. Okay. Um, this is South Africa. This right? is South Africa. Okay. Yep. So Allison had, you know, written a statement. She had a petition going, and as far as we know, they have not been released. There is no update really on on the internet or any source that I was able to find that they have been released. So they are still behind bars. Um, Allison talks about her recovery of her injuries was incredibly painful. That she had to go through. All those things, they didn't know if she was going to be able to have children because her reproductive organs had been attacked so badly and violently. Well, I'm sure there were multiple surgeries involved. Multiple surgeries. Yep. And not only that, but they had to build the case while she was recovering because these guys, they were put away, but they weren't convicted yet. So they had to take note of all of her injuries. So she had to go to the hospital every so often, and they would make her strip down. And they would have to document all of her injuries. And mind you, most of her injuries are her neck and her pelvic and pubic region. Just reliving this. Reliving this. Over and over and over. Yes. Wow. And she did make it like a huge. She um, contacted the newspaper for them to put a big thank you because she couldn't personally thank all of the hospital staff herself. But even though they are there to help, I can't imagine having to go through that trauma. Yeah, I, I don't know how often they went, but I'm sure it had to be pretty often mm-hmm. for them to, to get updated on wounds and scarring and what the possibility of her life was going to be. So with this new legislation, did they actually appeal? Did they appeal and did they get paroled? They tried and they were denied. So that is all that we know, that they are still locked up. That's as far as we know and that she had made a statement to the courts and also has a petition to keep them there. So did they ever come out and say anything regarding, you know, why it was such a vicious attack on her reproductive organs? Why they hated women, or was it just something that that was a satanic thing? Well, we have the one that says that it's a demon, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the time when people work in pairs like that, they have more, you know, they have a leader. Someone in that pair is more of the actor, and the other person just kind of follows suit. But we, we see in this story... Both of them taking lead roles throughout the entire story. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to me as to why, because they don't really talk about why, rather than, one, he wanted to ruin everything that made her about a woman. He hated females, Satanism, and he was possessed by a demon. So with with all of the damage that was done um, in that region of her body, was... Allison ever able to, I mean, did she get married? Did she, has she ever been able to have children or even wanted to? So that's where we're going, where I'm at now with Allison, how she kind of recovers after all of this. And she goes on through life. She moves back with her mom and she says that she is hit with horrible depression, debilitating, crippling depression. Mm-hmm. And could not really find her way in life. She just, was traumatized until she went to a support group. And she said that in that moment, she felt better talking about it. And she reminded herself that I chose to live a life worth living. In that moment that she was 
suspended in space out of her body, she says, I want to live a life worth living. And that's when she decided to go back to her body and fight. And so she was reminded of that to live a life worth living. So Allison goes on and becomes a motivational speaker. She has written her own book called I Have Life. She has a husband, two biological children. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. So she becomes this motivational speaker. She has traveled to 30 countries and spoken there. She talks to rape victims, trauma victims, anything that people are struggling with in their life. She is just this crazy inspirational speaker and survivor of her story. Wow. That is incredible. I mean, you know, my mind keeps going back to just the attack itself and the damage that was done to her body. You know, again, the the human mind and what it is capable of. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just the fact that she came up, uh, you know, living with her mother, you know, in a a, single-parent household, all of that, I think that kind of, you know, you know, with kids that, that are brought up that way, they already have this survival mode right. kind of kicked in, you know, um, as it is, you know, because they have to face such adversities, you know, growing up. But, you know, to actually, you know, take an incident like that, such a, a horrible, horrible thing, and that sustain that type of injury and come through it, the way she has, and then on top of that, you know, not just surviving it, but then coming out on the other side, making sure that that her perpetrators, her attackers were were punished, and then making that conscious decision to actually, you know, go for everything that she could in life. I mean, it is a real testament to her intestinal fortitude, Mm -hmm. you know, her, her bravery. Yeah, I, I, I'm just completely amazed by that. Yeah, she's com- she's incredible. Um, like you said, the inner strength and fortitude that it takes not only to survive this, but then to actually look at your life and say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be better than this. She refused to be or live as a victim. Right, and she states that she was allowing them to still have control by not living her life, not having the authentic life that she wants. Amazing young woman, for mm-hmm. sure. So where can you see this documentary again? Uh, Amazon Prime. It's called Amazon Allison. Prime. Yeah. Allison. And, and, and the name of the book? I Have Life. Yeah, it's, you know, one of the things is, even though we we hate to know that something this horrible, this evil, can actually happen to another human being, or that another human being could even be capable of, of such violence against another human being to see that there is strength and there is life after this it's it's a beacon actually for other women you know hopefully other women can can read this story uh watch this documentary that have been through you know these assaults and it has served as as a maybe like i said a beacon of hope for them mm-hmm, exactly All right, guys, so that is our first story here on The Rage Room. We want to take a moment to thank you guys for joining and listening to this incredible story of this incredible woman, Allison Bada. Please check out her documentary on Amazon Prime. You can order her book. You can go to allison.co, I believe is the website. I will link it down in the description below. She is an amazing beacon of hope for trauma survivors and people that are just trying to move forward in life after a tragic and terrible event and uh, we want to thank you guys for coming out yeah i've enjoyed it this has been a great time i'm really looking forward to discussing more cases do you have anything in mind of what our next discussion will be about i do although i'm not going to give it away so stay tuned for our next episode we're going to be posting weekly and um, typically we'll do a premiere in between our podcasts and our videos to let you know the release date of them All right, guys, thanks for joining us on our first episode of The Rage Room.